Hi everyone, my name is Dan Kretka. I'm an Associate Professor of Social Studies Education at the University of North Texas. Picture books about people and events in the past offer a great opportunity to help students develop critical thinking skills and to better understand history and what it means for us today. I want to introduce you to my historical thinking picture book method. There are really just three steps. First, you need to ensure the history in the picture book is accurate, affirming, and appropriate. There are a lot of problematic picture books, so I recommend leaning on experts and authors who are members of the communities they write about. For example, I turn to Debbie Reese's website to find picture books by indigenous authors who accurately depict their people and nations. Second, you should read through the picture book and write down historical thinking questions. I do this by reviewing historical thinking concepts. I find the six concepts on historicalthinking.ca and those are the most accessible for me, but there are other good sources for historical thinking. The six historical thinking concepts from the Historical Thinking Projects and, and Peter Satius are establish historical significance, use primary source evidence, identify continuity and change, analyze cause and consequence, take historical perspectives, and understand the ethical dimensions of historical interpretations. I then read the book and write down questions using the concepts. I have found that these types of questions allow for deeper understandings of the past. I won't review the concepts as that requires its own video, but the art of asking historical thinking questions is really about finding questions that help students think more deeply about the history in the book. And you got to do that without getting too sidetracked from the book and the story. Third, I try to apply an intersectional and critical perspective that critiques systems of oppression and power, centers and sees the perspectives of marginalized and oppressed groups, and seeks to help students better understand how to take anti-racist and justice-oriented actions. Intersectional perspectives align well with taking historical perspectives because it challenges us to understand identity, power, privilege, and oppression in different times and places. For example, students need to not only understand how black people overcome racism in the past, but they need to understand how white people created and enforced white supremacist systems, and then also how black people resisted those efforts. Too often, picture books focus on the courageous accomplishments of indigenous, black, or people of color, while only passively mentioning who is enforcing those systems. Historical thinking can help us interrogate the past more closely. Today I'm reading a book about a woman who is a model citizen who fought for democracy for all by fighting against white supremacy and for black liberation. You will notice that I include both historical que thinking questions and clarification or context questions as I read. I hope you enjoy the book. Ida B. Wells, Let the Truth Be Told by Walter Dean Myers, illustrated by Bonnie Christensen. I will read questions that I have written to go along with this book, and I will offer some examples of possible answers that students or teachers could have as part of their discussion. Ida Bell Wells was born on the 16th of July, 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. The first child of James Wells and his wife, Elizabeth, was beautiful, bright-eyed, and healthy. Still, there was much to worry about. James Wells, although a skilled carpenter, was legally a slave, and so was his wife. Three years later, the Constitution of the United States was changed. The 13th Amendment made slavery illegal. All the black people of Holly Springs were now free. Why were the Wells enslaved? That's right. They were enslaved because of the color of their skin. Many white Americans believed they were superior to black Ameri Americans and enslaved them. Over the next few years, young Ida was joined by three brothers and three sisters. The Wells children were taught to be responsible for one another and the family home. Each child had chores to do around the house. When the Methodists started a school in Holly Springs, James Wells made sure that his children attended. Our job was to go to the school and learn all we could, Ida would later say. Why did Elizabeth Wells go to school as an adult? White people made it illegal for many black people to read, 
So some black people did not learn to read until after slavery ended. Encouraged by both of her parents, Ida became a good student. She could handle schoolwork better even than some of the adults who were just learning to read after a lifetime of working in the cotton fields. But Ida saw that life was not good for all black people. If blacks were accused of crimes, they often would not get a trial. Some were even killed by angry white mobs. When a person was killed in this manner, it was called lynching. Ida saw the sadness and fear caused by the lynchings. Why do you think white people did not want black people to have freedom? As we said, they thought they were superior and deserved more. In 1877, 16 year old Ida was visiting her grandmother in another part of Mississippi when she learned that yellow fever had struck Holly Springs. Both of Ida's parents and her youngest brother died. Heartbroken, Ida returned home. She listened as the family's neighbors and friends talked about what they could do to help raise the Wells children. That won't be necessary. Ida stood up as tall as her five feet allowed. I can take care of my family. It wouldn't be easy, Ida knew. They could live in the house that her parents had owned and would have all the small savings that James Wells had carefully put aside. Ida decided to take a test to become a teacher. She had no experience teaching, but she had helped her sisters and brothers with their lessons. After passing the test, Ida taught in a small town six miles away from Holly Springs. A friend of the family agreed to keep the smaller children while Ida worked. Ida taught during the week and came home on weekends to do the washing and ironing for her brothers and sisters. Each Sunday night, Ida would ride back to the country school on an old mule. She worked in small schools around Holly Springs for two and a half years. Ida's Aunt Fanny lived in Memphis, Tennessee, 43 miles north of Holly Springs. There were more teaching opportunities there, and in 1881, Ida, now 19, moved to Memphis with two of her sisters. Teaching was just as hard there. Ida had to travel by train to get to her job. She often used the time on the train to read or write letters. She read newspapers or whatever books she could find. She also began to keep a diary. How was life different for people before cars were invented? Ida had to wait for a train instead of just get in a car. On a train it was easier to read and write than it was in cars. One day Ida took a seat in the ladies coach of the train. The conductor refused to take her ticket and told her to move to the smoking car. Ida knew that the conductor wanted her to move because she was black. She refused. The conductor tried to pull her out of the seat. Ida was small. She braced her feet against the seat in front. When the conductor put his hand on her arm, she bit him. The conductor got two strong men, and together they dragged Ida from the car. Ida, very upset, left the train and went back to Memphis. Why did Ida not move to the smoking car? Ida knew it was wrong for white people to make her move because they were racist, and she had been preparing to stand for justice. Ida decided to sue the railroad. She won her case in court and is awarded $500. The local newspaper, the Memphis Appeal Avalanche, ran the story. The headline read, Darkie Damsel Gets Damages. Ida also wrote about the incident for her church paper, The Living Way. Later, the court's decision was reversed, and Ida did not receive the money she had won in court. But she did see how people reacted to the article she had written. Ida continued to write for her church paper, and soon black newspapers around the country began to carry her essays. She wrote under the name Iola and was called the Princess of the Press. T. Thomas Fortune, the noted New York publisher of the New York Age, wrote, She has become famous as one of the few of our women who handle a goose quill with diamond point as easily as any man in newspaper work. If Iola were a man, she would be humming independent in politics. She has plenty of nerve and is as sharp as a steel trap. By 1889, Ida had stopped teaching and wrote full-time. She even became part owner of a newspaper called Free Speech and Headlight. 
in August 1892, both her sharp pen and her nerve would be put to the test. Why did Thomas Fortune say, if Iola were a man, she would be humming independent in politics? Thomas Fortune knew that men had more opportunities than women because people were sexist at that time, which means they believed women were inferior to men. Women were often denied the same opportunities. The People's Grocery Store was owned by three of Ida's friends. A dispute occurred between the three and some white men who did not like the idea that black men owned the store. A fight ensued and shots were exchanged. The next morning, hundreds of black men were arrested, including Ida's friends. Several days later, the store owners were taken from the jail by a white mob and murdered. Ida was filled with grief and anger. She knew that the deaths of black men were often ignored. Longing for justice, Ida turned to the only weapon she had, her writing. In her articles for Free Speech and Headlight, Ida urged the black people of Memphis to leave town or stop supporting white businesses or riding the white-owned streetcar line. Ida Wells had organized one of the first economic boycotts. She was threatened and her friends feared for her life. When Ida left town to visit New York, her office was invaded by hoodlums and destroyed. Why do you think Ida's friends feared for her life? Ida's friends knew that laws treated black people differently than white people. Sometimes police and judges would not protect black lives. Ida was forced to leave Memphis, but she was determined not to be quiet or fearful. She began writing for the New York Age from her new home in Chicago. Her articles exposed the poor treatment of black people, especially black men. More than any other person in America, she spoke and wrote about the crime of lynching. She believed that all Americans, black and white, were entitled to equal justice. In 1893, she published a book on lynching titled The Red Record. Her good friend Frederick Douglass wrote an introduction to the book. Dear Miss Wells, brave woman, you have done your people and mine a service which can neither be weighed or, nor measured. Ida was invited to speak in England and Scotland. She spoke with eloquence and passion about the unfair treatment of black men. In June 1895, Ida B. Wells married Ferdinand Lee Barnett, an attorney and newspaper publisher. Susan B. Anthony, who fought so hard for women's rights, worried that Ida would give up her life as a crusader for justice. Ida replied, Miss Anthony, you don't believe in women getting married? She said, Oh yes, but not women like you who had a special call for special work. I know of no one in this country better fitted to do the work you had in hand than yourself. Although she was raising her family, Ida Wells did not abandon her role as a fighter. In 1900, the Chicago Tribune ran a series of articles recommending school segregation. Ida asked for help from another brave warrior in the fight for social equality, Jane Addams. Miss Adams brought together a group of influential white business people to hear Ida plea her case. Ida Wells convinced them to help keep Chicago schools open for all children. Why did Susan B. Anthony think Ida should not marry? Many women, especially white women, were expected to work inside the home as mothers, not outside the home as writers. But black women often were more likely to work outside the home than white women. Although a wife and mother, Ida continued to write and organize. In 1909, she was one of the major speakers and organizers of the group that would eventually call itself the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Ida Wells understood that among African Americans, there were important differences. Those who were powerful and doing well often weren't willing to make a commitment to help the poorest among them. They wanted to be respectable. Ida Wells also wanted to be respectable, but felt it was her duty to fight for justice. I'd rather go down in history as one lone Negro who dared to tell the government that it has done a dastardly thing to save my skin by taking back what I have said.
Ida continued her fight for justice by taking up the cause of suffrage, her friend Susan B. Anthony's lifelong mission. After talking to Anthony about voting rights, Ida was convinced that women's suffrage was critical to political change for black women. In 1913, Ida created the Alpha Suffrage Club. It was the first voting organization for black women in the state of Illinois. At Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration in 1913, Ida and 5,000 other women marched for the right to vote. When white suffragists asked Ida to march in the separate colored section, Ida sternly refused. It took several more years of hard work by Ida and many others, but women finally won the right to vote in 1920. Why did white suffragists ask black suffragists to march in a separate section? Some white suffragists were racist, and others were scared to offend racists. Ida was anti-racist, so she spoke the truth, but many black women did not get the right to vote for over 40 more years. Ida Wells spoke up for what she believed her weapons were her keen mind and her pen. Leaders as different as W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, the black nationalist, consulted her. In 1930, feeling candidates for the state legislature in Illinois were not doing enough for the people, she ran for state senate. She did not win the race, but again her clear and passionate voice was heard. The following year, on the 25th of March, Ida B. Wells died. For more than half a century, this dynamic, intelligent woman used her writing skills to promote freedom, safety, and justice. She made America a better place. How can we be anti-racist today when rules or laws favor white people? Our government could pay reparations for the lost wealth from years of white advantage and black disadvantage, or we could address unfair treatment of black people in schools, voting, laws, and courtrooms today. Students may use the timeline in the back of the book to practice their chronological thinking skills. And there are great quotes from Ida B. Wells in the back. Thank you for listening.